Hey everyone, welcome to the Watch and Listen podcast. It's a podcast all about watches with myself, Matt Fair, and your host, Cameron Weiss. This episode of the Watch and Listen podcast is brought to you by Crown and Caliber. Crown and Caliber is the official luxury watch retailer of the Watch and Listen podcast. They stock every brand you can think of, uh, from Rolex and Omega to Patek Philippe, Audemars Piguet, Vacheron, Blancpain, uh, and even some very oddballs from companies that don't exist anymore. Uh, they've got aggressive prices. Uh, they have fair trade-in values. Yes, I said trade-in. You can trade your watch into Crown and Caliber uh, for an upgrade, or if you want it, a downgrade. You can uh, trade your watch in for cash if you want. And uh, that is very nice. And uh, they they work by mail as well. So if you're not in the state of Georgia, there could be some benefits for you uh, for buying a watch from Crown and Caliber. Uh, code Matt150, M A T T 150, will get you $150 off uh, anything you buy at Crown and Caliber. Um, it's one time use per person, so you can't use it over and over. However, uh, we know from the trackings that a few people have. I've actually bought watches using that code, and uh, I hope you are happy with them. Um, additionally, at the end of this podcast, uh, it is Watch Madness over at Crown and Caliber. Uh, we've got a bracket going. Who will have the top spot in watches? And uh, you guys can play along at home and win some baller ass prizes from Crown and Caliber. I'm talking about you can win straps, gift certificates, service, uh, and even. Swiss watches. I don't know what brands or models they are giving away, but they will be giving away some watches. Uh, check it out at crowningcaliber.com. And at the end of this podcast, Cameron and I are going to go through our watch madness brackets. Uh, the It will be done by voting, I believe. So uh, check it all out at crowningcaliber.com. Get your bracket filled out. Play against us and win some prizes. This episode of Watch and Listen is also brought to you by Beeline Coffee. I'm drinking it right now. It's delicious. From light roast with a light body to dark roast to espresso roast. Um, If you're into cars, if you're not into cars but you're into watches, and you love a good, delicious sip of Java, Beeline Coffee has you covered. Uh, Cameron Weiss has a roast. I have a roast, and the reason that we work with them, we run on coffee, basically. Cameron's putting watches together all day. I'm doing emails, driving all over the world. The two of us run on coffee, and uh, Beeline Coffee keeps us going. It's delicious. Code Chrono, C-H-R-O-N-O, Code Chrono, will get you uh, 15% off your entire order at BeelineCoffee.com. No matter how big or small, uh, you can get one bag, you can get 10 bags, or you can get a subscription plan for Beeline Coffee, and I'll give you uh, 15% off your entire order if you use code CHRONO. Um, Also, if you listen to the other podcast, code TST works as well. Uh, And now, on this episode of Watch and Listen, Cameron and I are going to go through what we call the family tree of watches. Um, Pretty much all major watch manufacturers are related by a few different parent companies and suppliers, and we're going to take you through that family tree Right about now. Hello, everyone. It's watching, listen, what's happening? Matt Farah here. Uh, yapping at you from the starboard side of the ship with my boy Cameron Weiss. What's happening, brother? Oh, it's just I'm kind of in awe by all of these watches right now. <laughs> Cameron's got an orgy of watches yeah. in front of him uh, right now, which Crown and Caliber has sent over for the purposes of this demonstration. Uh, we haven't recorded an episode in a couple weeks. I went on vac- vacaciones. Yeah. And uh, as it turns out, the Rolex GMT Master makes a good snorkeling watch in the Galapagos. That's what we learned. All right. I was going to so ask what you were wearing. I, I wore the GMT Master, and I felt kind of silly, actually, because everybody was, like, hyper-practical. Hyper-practical. Like, a lot of Casio Digitals. You oh, know? Yeah. Like, everyone was like, South America? Hide your g- bling. 
you yeah. know, and so um although actually my dad wore a watch that for uh for our cheap watches too, whenever we do our cheap watches too, my dad got a Luminox, which is I think is a good functional quartz. It's like a Navy SEAL watch. Yeah, it's perfect. Like rubber perfect for the dive boat. Really bright bright uh, uh, loom paint. Um, we actually have a little bit of housekeeping before we get into uh, this episode, the family tree of watches. Um, you went to the uh, the Hodinky LA meetup. Yeah. How was it? It was great. Yeah? I, I had a lot of fun, actually. Um, it was the rooftop of the Ace Hotel. Which is a good spot. Yeah, That's it was a cool. great spot. Yeah. Is it? Here's the thing. I'm used to going to car shows, right? And you can go to a car show and look at someone's car, you know, and then they, like, notice... You're looking at their car, and then you talk about it. But like with watches, it's like kind of creepy to be like staring at dudes' hands, right? You know what though? When you go to a watch event, that's expected. It, it's expected, mm-hmm. and it kind of when you first get there, you're a little kind of freaked out by it. Yeah, looking around, kind of peering at everybody's I, wrists, eyes and, down, everybody. But then you realize everybody's doing that. Yeah, and then people are just taking off their watches. There's you, you of course have those people that have two watches on, three oh, watches yeah. on, the three? or they even Did have someone have a three watches in every pocket, things really? like that. Yeah, because that's the thing, right? Is like you want, you know, you can only bring one car yeah. to the show, but in theory, you could roll strapped with a few different. Yeah, options. I prefer to do one time piece. Yeah, and then leave the rest to people's imagination, and you can bring something out people's different at another time. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> what does this guy have at home? You know, if that's what's on his wrist, there must be something cool what's at home. What's that uh, that ludicrous song, "My Business"? It's like, what do you got in that case? Yeah. <laughs> Did people really roll up with like multiple pockets full? Oh of yeah, that's there was people. So with, I, in fact, I saw pocket watches too. That's cool. Yeah, I think you. Sh- uh, here's what you c- should be allowed to do: if you're wearing a belt. <laughs> that holds up your pants. You should be able to thread like a couple of dozen watch heads around that belt and then just lift up your shirt and spin around. <laughs> but uh, I heard that was good. You yeah, got it was a, little, a, it was you a got, great event. You got a shout out in that article. Oh, yeah, you yeah. Did. A nice picture. Yep. Um, also, I spoke to the people at Crown and Caliber. Bunch of folks have used code MAT150 to get $150 off of their watches. Um, which, as of the middle of last week, was over twenty five grand in watches. So, like, people are buying some nice watches for Crown and Caliber. So, if you have, if you're out there and you've bought a watch, uh, yo, send me a picture. I want to see what you bought. I'm excited for you. Um, also, we are at the end of this program going to be participating in Watch Madness. It's March Madness, but for watches, and it's brackets and it's betting. And I know what you're thinking, Watch Madness. What are you folks doing? But hear me out, you can win things, like real things, some of which are very expensive, up to and including winning actual luxury watches from Crown & Caliber. Right? Yeah. Right. Did you bring your bracket? I did not bring my bracket. What? I have it on my phone, but uh, I did bring one out. At the end of this program, we're going to break out your bracket and my bracket and see how we both did uh, in Watch Madness. Lastly, I got this book. Uh, by Matt Horan. Is it Horanic? How do you do? You know how to pronounce yeah, Matt Matt's Rannick. Rannick? Yep. Is the H silent? Uh, I, I pretty much silent. Rannick? There's a little bit of a Horanic. <laughs> um, a man on his watch, which uh was not sent comped. I bought it. Not that it only it only matters because a lot of people recommended I buy it, and I did buy it, and it was very good. And uh, I read through it in a day. It's like a coffee table book, but that also has um stories uh from people in the watch industry. Uh, various celebrities and or interesting folks and some very interesting story of of their watches and it was it's a very good book and if you are into watches or you have you someone in your life is into watches uh makes a good gift as well if i got this as a gift i'd have been very very happy and uh you know matt right yeah yeah matt's been to our workshop um we did something together with carnivore wines what uh, is and we made a video and I uh, had an event in downtown LA. And uh, his website is uh, the William Brown Project.com, which frankly has nothing to do with the book A Man and His Watch. Uh, uh, he'll, he said, I emailed him after I got through the book. I emailed him through, through, through his website and invited him on the show, and he said he would love to come in, uh, probably in April. Uh, so he can explain further what the William Brown Project is. But good book. Really good book. Yeah. And he said, well, he said he's working on his next book which is a similar undertaking of a similar topic 
but one that I could not be any more excited about. <laughs> and I'm sure anyone out there who knows me could probably figure out what his next book is that I would be particularly excited about. Anyway, other than that, our podcast, Cameron, our little show here is kicking ass. Our yeah. numbers are strong. You yeah. are looking good. Thank you to all of you who are enjoying the show. Yeah, and I even spoke to uh, a bunch of people at the Hodinky event. Yeah, which were really excited uh, about the podcast. I got to answer a lot of questions and, and well, meet some uh, listeners. That that means we're appealing to watch nerds and yeah. not just newbies. If you're going to a Hodinky event, you're not amateur hour. Yeah, you are, you are a thorough watch nerd. So thank you, watch nerds. And uh, I go through all the comments and stuff on YouTube, and and I I have been looking and. All suggestions, most of which have been positive, or if not positive, at the very least fair in nature, uh, are going to are get written down and maybe implemented. You guys have had a lot of good ideas for upcoming shows. It is very clear you want more cheap watches. <laughs> cheap watches, too. There's been hundreds of suggestions for cheap watches, too. And then we're trying to figure... I want to figure out. I've been trying to figure out. I've been talking to people how to figure out how to do a $500 to $1,000 watch episode because with cheap watches it was easy we just bought the watches and then yep. returned them but we i don't want to have to buy 15 grand in 500 hundred dollar watches and crowning caliber doesn't really sell that stuff so if you are out there and you own one of those stores that's like in the mall that sells a bunch of 500 to a thousand dollar watches and you want us to plug the shit out of you that's cool let hit me up, and maybe we can feature all of your five hundred thousand dollars watches. Uh, lastly, before we do the real thing, follow Mr. Cameron Weiss on Instagram, Cameron M. Weiss and Weiss Watch Company. Also on Instagram, it's written right here. Look, followed by himself, <laughs> <laughs> and then of course follow me on Instagram, uh, the Smoking Tire. Uh, as I shamelessly sell my spider dial, <laughs> GMT. On I saw that pop up. That's a yeah. that's a good deal. Nothing in it for me. I already they are, oh, Crown and Caliber already owns it. But um, that's what happens when I buy. You know, I bought that perpetual, traded it, and now I get to see my shit for sale yeah. on Crown and Caliber. Um, so here we are, and you brought this topic up uh, when we first sat down to make topics. You said I really want to do a whole show about the family tree of watches. Why did you think this was so important? Because there's really not a lot of uh, separation between the watch companies anymore, at least the brands. They're very close, and the ones that are separated, they actually have a lot in common and have a lot of history tied in together with each other. Um, so I, I think it's one of the more interesting things about the watch industry is getting into... The, a little bit of the history of the company, but mainly where their watches come from, who yeah. owns them, um, and what brands share in common, really. So to make a, a very obvious analogy, there are only a few car companies. Yeah. You know, there's Volkswagen, Audi Group, which is Volkswagen, Audi, Porsche, Lamborghini, Bentley, Bugatti, Skoda, uh, and I'm definitely blanking on at least one other one, that I can't remember. Uh, and then, you know, Ford, uh, you know, uh, Lincoln, etc., GM, Toyota, like the, these Honda, you know, these five companies pretty much cover Fiat, you know, cover everything. Same same yeah. idea? Same idea. Same exact idea. Same amount of parts sharing, same amount of cross engineering. What yeah. what gets what what yeah. is the benefit to a company joining uh, the big corporate conglomerate? Well, there's very few independent standalone companies to begin with, and the the companies that used to be independent didn't necessarily have independence manufacturing wise. So, so they would, you mean they would they would still have to buy stuff yeah, from someone just else? Like, just like in the auto industry, nobody makes everything. Yeah, so, Morgan is independent, but they still buy BMW and in some cases yeah. Harley Davidson <laughs> engines. Yeah. yeah. So the the thing would be if if BMW started to started to falter and they were gonna shut down what do you do if, you, if you're relying on their parts yeah. for your car well you kind of have to pony up and figure out how to buy bmw's production oh so wow that you can keep your company around so, so. in the beginning you know the, right now the, there are four kind of major sort of holding companies yeah. that deal with uh 
How do we start? How do we explain this? What's the best way well, to start this? It, it this started. I, I think the the best way is from the beginning of Swiss watchmaking. Okay. And very early on, you had the watchmakers who were just farmers, and it was off season. They would make watches when they couldn't farm. Huh. So, so Ed, wait, are you telling me that in the on season they were farmers? You couldn't make enough money as a watchmaker that you could do it year round. You'd have to go back to farming your side hustle. I don't necessarily know if it was a money thing or a boredom thing. Oh, yeah. If, if you could imagine being up in the in the Swiss, I just um, really love the tilling, Swiss tilling this mountain. <laughs> yeah. Well, who? I mean, there's worse things to do than yeah. you know ride a cow around <laughs> the side of an alp. Right. In yeah. the summertime, it's beautiful. Yeah. You're outside, and then the winter rolls you're around. Stuck and you're stuck inside with snow, and you can't make it over the pass mm-hmm. to get to the city. Mm-hmm. So huddle you, over a table. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Sit there by candlelight, looking into the snow-covered Just fields, and imagine make doing your job by candlelight. Yeah. How I, shitty would that be? I don't think I'd be able to do it. My eyes would would go out on me way too quick. If I made you assemble one of your watches by candlelight, do you think it would come out better or worse than one of those like 1910 era pocket watches from Switzerland? I, <laughs> wobbly balance wheel. <laughs> right? I don't know. I mean, they had lower timekeeping standards because technology was was not as advanced, mm-hmm. so now we're very very strict. It's kind of yeah. like if you were a medical doctor 100 years ago. Yeah. It was kind of witchcraft. <laughs> Yeah, no. And every now it's very every sterile. dollop podcast yeah. I listen to, which involves medicine, is like he did what? Yeah, <laughs> they did a lot of bloodletting. <laughs> really yeah. fucked up. Um, yeah. So okay. So, so this goes back to the, the uh, farmers in yeah. Switzerland, and you had the watchmakers up in the the mountain areas, uh-huh. uh huh, in the valleys, and they would come in in the springtime when the pass cleared, and they'd bring the movements down to the jewelers who were in the city. Okay. And they would case them up and put their own name on them. So the jeweler would. If you were, you know, Mr. Vacheron, you would bring your movement into the city, sell it, and the jeweler would put the jeweler's name on the dial and case it up in a, a precious metal case and sell it. So that was the beginning of kind of buying the engine of the watch and then casing it would up. Would you say this is what they look like? The Swiss yeah, that's, watch? That, that's, in <laughs> fact, <laughs> I know that guy on the right. <laughs> would you say that's Dave Vacheron? <laughs> yes. Uh, <laughs> yes, that's Dave and Jeff. For, uh, <laughs> for those of you who can't see this, it looks like the grumpy old man yeah. of Swiss <laughs> yeah. Swiss Farm. Jeff watch. Constantine and, uh, yeah. and Dave Vacheron, and Dave Vacheron yeah, right yeah. there. <laughs> So these guys would sell their movements to jewelers, and the jewelers would put the name and get all the credit. Yeah, they would they would take the credit. They this would make a lot of the money as well, um, and they kind of built brands around that. This so is that was the bullshit. Beginning. You know what this sounds like? The modern marijuana business. No. The growers get nothing. The retailers put the brand name on it, and there's a lot of growers right now. So the price is wholesale is driven way down, but the retailers are making a ton of money yeah. by selling brand name ganja products. That but it's guys all, it's like all really the same right? guys like Dave Vacheron and Steve Constantine <laughs> over there are grow, growing up in the yeah. hills in between yodeling in the uh, in the on season and <laughs> in the off season. Who knows what they're doing? They're probably building guns. <laughs> um, all right. So who were these jewelers taking all the credit? Um. Is that know. where the the original brands came well, from? Is that where, or is it the other way around? S- uh, that's not where the brands that we know today came from. Uh-huh. But that was the start of it. That was very small time at that point. It would be like a mom and pop jewelry store that would do it. Okay. Um, so if you look at really old vintage stuff, you'll find that it doesn't have a maker that exists today. But the maker was of some note at that time period, possibly. Yeah. They had a big um, shop in Paris or yeah, something, right? Yeah. Exactly. Um, but then from there, it, it changed, and you ended up with. Um, kind of watch designers. Okay. And they would source these components and these maybe whole movements, whatever. Um, and they would source the parts, the dials, the cases. And it all came from somebody else's workshop. Not to say it was of any less quality. Yeah. But there was a specialized person for everything. There was one guy that only makes dials. And there was one guy that only makes the indices that go onto the dial. Wow. And they came together in a workshop that only applied indices to the, <laughs> the dials. Do- really? And then from there, oh, it would so go for like paint to a place that only three dozen shops that are just going for, the for all this yeah. stuff. Yeah. Um, and then what happened is when those businesses either started to fail mm-hmm. or the companies that supported them did so well, either, either of those two options, uh, like in Rolex's case, yeah, they ended up buying their case manufacturer, their movement oh, manufacturer. Okay. They bought their dial manufacturer. Is this what you hope to do someday? Um, 
I I hope to have all of that in the U.S. Okay, we would like so to you have start that with you start with that and yeah. then go to here's I'm just I don't know I have weird Google images of dial <laughs> painting. Uh, okay, so, so they started buying few, up their uh, their suppliers. Yeah, they bought up their suppliers. Okay. Then on the other hand, you have uh, suppliers that weren't doing so well. The companies that they were working with were not purchasing the same volume as companies like Rolex and. They, they were having a hard time keeping their people busy, especially with the quartz crisis that came into... Oh, we're, we've now, we're now fast-forwarded into the 1970s here. Uh, I, so from the, the early 1900s yeah. through to the, the 1970s, you're going to have growth in that sector, but you had... It was still like a cottage mom-and-pop yeah. kind of business. Like, out... In the fields, you had a, a company that really just made parts for a handful of watch companies. Uh-huh. Um, and these were all pretty small businesses. Like right. They might have a few employees, and they make a, a couple of items, and that's that. Like, yeah, but they're they're the guy. You know, they're, they could be supported on 1,500 watches a year or whatever. Yeah. Little, little yeah. amounts of stuff. So this all, all of this pre-Quartz crisis, yeah. you could support a... There was a, such a thing as a... Sm- quote, small watch business. Yeah. That was a thing. That It worked. And the quartz crisis pretty much just wiped that out entirely. Yeah. It, okay. And it would have wiped it out entirely had it not been for Nicholas Hayek. Okay. Who is Nicholas Hayek? Nicholas Hayek, uh, he was the founder of Swatch Group. Okay. So, Which is one of the four. Yeah, that's one of the biggest four. And a look, I have, wait, where did I go? Where did it go? I have my thing here. Ah! What happened? It's all gone wrong. So with the uh, the Swatch Group, Nicholas oh. Hayek was actually hired by the Swiss government to consult. He had an engineering firm, and they wanted uh, him to consult on how to save the Swiss watch industry. Okay. Um, and a couple of things he did that helped out a lot were taking the companies and consolidating them. All these little mom and pop companies that were going to go out of business, he took all of that knowledge and he consolidated it into a single company. So was Swatch itself a brand? Not at that point. Before the Swatch Group? Uh, so not the at that point. Plastic quartz Swatch watches that didn't exist. that didn't exist at that point. Okay, so the brand they were still trying to figure out. Yeah, it wasn't it wasn't Swatch Group yet. It that. Was, did a company make little plastic watches, or did someone figure that out? He figured that out. He Nicholas Hayek yeah. also figured yeah. that out. Okay, wow. That was that was the second phase. Um, first, they had to consolidate some of these companies so that they would they would still have all the tools, mm-hmm. all the knowledge, all the documentation, uh, and you wouldn't have this this guy in his small shop just shut it down and throw away all the all the tools and fire all the people, and then they go do something else. Right. So they wanted to save all of that. So by consolidating you, it. So if you go to Swatch's website now, it actually, I mean, I'm, they did, there wasn't a website then, and I don't know if they organized the company like this, yeah. but it's actually divided by high-end, or, you know, super high-end, high-end, medium, low. Yeah, right? and that came, that was secondary. First, that they just saying, did suppliers. It, okay. was not, it was not necessarily big brands. So first, it, Swatch Group, the group, would say, yeah. okay, we're going to, all of everyone under Swatch Group, you know, we'll give you funding, but you're going to use our dial maker and you're going to yeah. use our hand maker and you're going to use our whatever. So you design it, submit us the designs, and then we we're your supplier. Yeah, it's like how is Breitling going to exist if all of their dial makers and case makers and hand makers close their doors? Right, right. You know, so, all of a sudden you've got Breitling gone and. That's a huge company that needs to stick around to make money for the Swiss people. Right. So under these types of this type of agreement, do we have Swatch Group owns the dial maker, and in this case, we've got I don't know Blanc Pond goes to Swatch's dial, or it started is with, it more uh, like with a few separate groups, like and they it, started yeah. consolidating into to smaller groups. Uh, and then all of those groups were combined into one Swatch Group, okay. and Nicholas G. Hayek being a very smart person that he was he actually took ownership at each step when they consolidated a little bit mm-hmm. so by the end he was by the end he's he pulling serious group. points yeah. on the vig yeah. but the question is okay if we look at our list i'm sorry for going back and forth video people all <laughs> right here's a list of all these brands right let's say blanc pond is really good at making dials and certina is really good at making hands and 
you know, Glass Chute is really good at making balance wheels. Like, is that how it works, or are all these companies going to balance wheel supplier A, hand supplier B, that are not brands that also are so selling watches? It's not that clear cut uh-huh. because you have a company like Blancpain, which mm-hmm. they had movements that they made. Yeah. Um, then you also have a company like um, Jacques Adro that made unbelievable dials. So there were certain things that they did excel at. And then what they did is they would put that into one area and they could provide dials for the whole group. That's what I was asking. Yeah. yeah what I was asking is, do they go, okay, the br- the band brand that is the best at making cases makes everybody's cases. Yeah. The and brand well, that's the they, best at hand. They actually would take hands. it away from that company. Oh, really? So if you were making a movement of your own. They'd like eminent they'd, domain they'd your that, movement? Yeah, they'll pull oh, that movement from wow. you. And create, give it to everybody? Not. They started that way, but yeah. then they had to turn it into be a little more exclusive. <laughs> so they have tiers. All of a sudden, the like, yeah. <laughs> Blanc Pond makes the every movement yeah. for every. Yeah, okay. Blanc Pond uh, never made it into the Swatch group, uh, into the Swatch plastic watches. <laughs> no, that would be that would be like a, like a sleeper, right? Yeah, right? Like if you what if you were the guy yeah. who took, you know, the the Paddock Calatrava you know, movement and yeah. like shoved it into a pink plastic swatch. Be, uh, it would make no sense at all, but that's kind of cool. Yeah. Be, it, we, there are, there were, are some sleepers out there that have some very interesting things like that, um, that you will find. Do we, um, well, so swatch group, let's now, now we know how these groups get formed, I guess. Yeah. Right. So that's swatch was the first big one. Is that where we're going with this? Uh, yeah. Yeah. Swatch was the first big one. Um, and then you had some other uh, other groups kind of came out because you still had brands that were independent of Swatch Group. Right, 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 right. right. Yeah. I'm just saying, in, I'm trying to I'm trying to establish what the best order is to effectively tell the story of this. Where do we want? Where do you want to go from here? Uh, from here, yeah. I think we could talk about how that affected the the Swatch products. All right. Um, because later they came up with the the plastic watch, the Swatch watch, and mm-hmm. that helped out a lot. But, uh, so how did the combination of all these brands together affect the product? So for Swatch Group, it's really pretty interesting because they own not only brands that you know about, like Blancpain, Omega, Swatch, Longines, these, these companies, they own those, but they also own a lot of unknown companies. Companies that, that would companies that do that what? don't even have websites. You can't find them on the internet. <laughs> They what? do not totally exist outside of Swatch fully Group. Fully analog? Like what? Yeah, very old school. Uh, if you are not a Swatch company, you cannot order parts from them. You cannot have them make a part. You won't even be able to find them in the phone book. Just off the grid. Totally off the grid. Subsidiary. For Swatch only. Huh. Yeah. Okay. So if, uh, if you happen to be a designer in a Swatch-owned company, you have access to this place that has been making escape wheels forever or yeah, whatever. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, has been making screws for forever, and they can make a beautiful screw, or they could make a really cheap, inexpensive screw to go in the lowest level watch. Yeah, but that's um, all they do. But screw. that's all they do. Yeah. And these companies can, is are Is it just, like Area 51? Can you find them on Google Maps? You can. <laughs> like, you can. I fully uh, off. Is this something you did when you were in Switzerland? Was like, go they find used, these They shady... used to not be so secretive about it because they still sold to outside companies. Uh-huh. But they started to wean those companies off of their products, and, and now then they like, disappeared completely. Just and like then one veiled. day the phone is disconnected. <laughs> yeah. It's like, hey guys, what's going yeah. on? It's so like, I have lists from when I started out of some of these companies that just went quiet all of a sudden. That's so funny. Um, really yeah, out of business? No, nope. no, we're They're not, still not out of business. Nope. <laughs> but only for Swatch Group now. Interesting. Yeah, oh. and so something like an Eta movement, mm-hmm. which is in a lot of watches, um, Eta doesn't manufacture every part that goes into that movement. Swatch owns ETA, and ETA mainly is assembling movements for the larger companies. Oh, I didn't even realize that ETA didn't make... Uh... So they do make components, but yeah. not all of the components. It's an ETA movement. They have, they have other sub-companies that so, make... Well, that's, that's, a, a Lang. that's a Lang movement. Yeah, that why one's not that an say, ETA. Yeah, why did that say ETA movement, guy? That's an ETA I movement. I don't know. Yeah, that, that one's an ETA movement. Sorry, I just pulled up a, a Lang. That's not, that wasn't fair of me. <laughs> Uh, <coughs> people are like, "Wow, that movement's very pretty." It's that's because it's like that's Valjoux. That's it, right? Yep. Yeah, that's it. Yeah, that's one of their chronographs. Yeah, Google Maps or Google Images changed our whole game right now because you they won't look. Look, they won't let you full screen this image anymore. They must have known exactly what we were doing. Yeah, 
They, it's it's not cool. They're onto us. It's not cool. <laughs> so all right. So so Swatch owns Etta, but Swatch also owns the company that, that Etta, Etta would go to to make the parts. movements. So everyone thinks like, oh, Etta is the. They have so much knowledge, ownership, and it's damaging to the rest of the industry. But it's not Etta. They're not the devil here. They're not like holding on to secret information. They just have other suppliers. They don't even have a phone. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. They won't talk to you unless you're hundreds of thousands of watches a year that you're looking to have them assemble for you, basically. Wow. Yeah. What do we have? What did they? What did Crown and Caliber send us from Swatch Group? They sent Swatch us an, a lovely Omega. Yeah. Let's so pull that thing. We've up. got uh, this that's, Omega here, and I'll move the others. Zoom in a little bit on it. Uh, that's a Planet Ocean. Yeah. It's very very pretty. So, f- as an example, Swatch Group owns Omega the brand. Mm-hmm. They also own uh, Frederick Piguet, which used to make watches. They used to have their own watches. Yeah, I've seen a vintage Piguet before. Yeah. Yeah, but now it's just movements, so right? What they did is they the brand name wasn't strong enough. Uh-huh. Uh, so they started doing just the movements. And the movements had historically been sold to other fine watchmakers outside of the Swatch Group. And they still are today. So you'll actually find this. This is a special one because it's Omega. It's a coaxial. So this is an 1185 Frederick Piguet movement that has the George Daniels coaxial added into it. Oh, it's got them combined. Yeah. Oh. So basically, Omega uh, and Frederick Piguet came together and created this with the help of George Daniels and... This is kind of like a mix of everything that Swatch Group owned at the time to make this watch. Oh, how interesting. Then... It's like the full right? like weight of the Swatch Group yeah. you know, engineering into one watch. I yeah. really like how this watch looks. I think this is a very attractive right? watch. And actually, I mean, it's a third of the price, give or take, of the Rolex Daytona. It's way easier to read time off. How much is this thing? Uh, Planet Ocean. $3,100? Right. Wow, that's a that's a great looking watch for thirty one hundred dollars. Yeah. yeah, and it's a an amazing movement. In fact, we also have a Blanc Pond here. Wait, what is the what is the extra knob for on the on the extra bu- that's uh, the, the other side? Is that helium quick escape. Set? Oh, that's an escape yeah. valve. Oh. Helium escape valve. Yeah. So it's more like a it's like a sea dweller. Yeah, this so is a this is a sea master. Well, I know. Yeah, I know. It's it's a sea master of Planet Ocean. Yeah. But it's the, the so chronograph sort with, of thing. With Rolex, they only do the the helium escape valve on the the sea dweller. Yeah. Uh, and the deep sea now, but with Sea Master, they do the uh, the helium escape at Sea Master. They don't have multiple levels. Oh, on all dive. of them. Oh, cool. Yeah. It's very very pretty watch. Yeah. So wait, why? All right. This is this watch is new ish, right? It's not brand new, but it's new ish. Yeah, and actually, so the movement in this this mm-hmm. movement they don't they don't use it anymore. Because it's a hybrid movement yeah. of not an Omega only movement. So what are the, what would the new version of that use? The same thing in that Speedmaster, the Valjo? Yeah. Uh, yeah. No, no. It would be the same thing the, as uh, uh, as in your Dark Side of the Moon. Yeah. Same movement as that one. Not mine anymore. Yeah. yeah. The new coaxial. The yeah. coaxial movement. Cool. That's yep. a very pretty watch. Wait, what was the other one that you said that and we had something else? A Blanc Pond? Yeah. So where is that Blanc Pond? We'll pull up the Blanc Pond wow. and. This thing is super pretty. Right? This is a gorgeous super watch. Super pretty. So this Blanc Pond, same movement. Same really? movement as that uh, Seamaster. Put it, put the Seamaster... So when you look at like these movements, right? If you've got the same movement, does that mean you're going to have the same sub-dial function and spacing as well? Or pretty can much. you rearrange that stuff? Uh, you you can a little bit. The spacing is, is going to be hard to change. Right. Usually it's done through um, just like tricking the eye by changing the size of the subdial, but the hand is the same location, you know? Yeah. If yeah. that makes any sense, yeah, they'll yeah. try to trick you a little bit. Yeah. With uh, different features. Like this one has a big bezel on it on the, uh, on the Seamaster. So it doesn't seem like the movement is really tiny in there yeah. because of the big bezel. There's another watch that we have. And I forget, is it, is it that, is it the, it's for, uh, the reason we have chronographs is because the next episode we're doing is chronographs. One of the chronographs we have has a small movement relative to a rather chunky uh, face. Yeah. And they fill in the gap with a, 
uh, quote, a tacky meter. But ah, it's like yes. it's a pretty u- like who the hell uses no one uses a tacky meter anymore. And like wh- when we get to it next episode, you'll immediately be like, oh, this is what he was talking yeah. about. Yeah. But that's funny. Those are two like massively different sized right? watches. And so I'll, I'm going to show you the the back of this bunk pond just because it's really cool, um, and you can see the movement. You're going to look at it and go, what? I oh. can't see the movement. What? You okay, can't so, see the movement. So this. What is are a- you talking about, Cameron? Check this out. Ooh, hang on. Let me zoom in a bit. Right? I think you have to put it down and let it fuck... F- hit the fuckus button. Is there a, isn't there a fuckus button? Is it not focusing? There, it is. there no, we go. Now you, sometimes you have to refocus. Yeah. Well, it's very pretty. Right? Yeah. So and that's, that's the, that Frederick Piguet movement. How about that? And you want to know something else? What else? Is there, do you have, we have another watch that has it? This. Vacheron. Vacheron from the Richemont Group has the same movement. Wow. That Frederick Piguet. So Frederick Piguet doing well. They make v- that's a very great chrono. So they, they, they're they're uh, their business must be robust. Yeah, they're doing they're doing very well and right now. You can thank Swatch Group for saving them from uh, disappearing that's because cool. they didn't have a strong brand name at can, the time. Can can you Cameron Weiss, independent watchmaker, go and buy a Frederick Piguet movement if you want? Unfortunately, I cannot. Mm. The reason uh, a company like Vacheron has access to it is because of previous history working uh-huh. with them. Yeah, when uh, the company is as old as multiple grandfathers, things yeah. are going to be grandfathered. Yeah, <laughs> I'm gonna I'm putting this Vacheron on. Right? Oh, this actually, there's no way this is fitting me. This oh is yeah, for like the bracelet. My, yeah, it's for like my girlfriend's. I can't <laughs> even get it over my hand like this. They're dope though. Okay. Yeah. So what else do we need to know about Swatch Group? Um, I, I mean, it's very thorough of you. I think your your knowledge of Swatch Group is pretty exceptional. Can well, I be I went to a, my school was paid for by the Swatch Group, <laughs> so. So you I know take quite a, a bit. You about, take a course in, yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, but I think that's uh, one thing that that people should kind of take away from this episode is you will find the same mechanism and history from other watch companies within brands that you wouldn't think. Mm-hmm. You know, to think about a Frederick Piguet that's also in Vacheron Constantine, and then you buy this Omega, which is really pretty low price category. Yeah, and it also has the George Daniels Escapement in it. Is kind of very like, cool. Wow, that's pretty cool, right? Yeah, very cool. Yeah. So we have another uh, another major major brand or uh, major corporation, the Richemont Group. Look yes. At this. Well, let's throw that Vacheron back under. And there. we can bring bring the Vacheron Take back. A better look. We've got uh, Roger. We got. I got to talk for a second about uh, the Roger. Is it Dubuis? Yeah. Is Dubuis Roger correct? Dubuis. Oh, thank God. <laughs> <laughs> wait, hang on. Wait. Je gère le côte. Huh? Yeah. Close? Yeah. I've got it. I think so. I got we'll it. We'll see. Comment got, if you don't the, think that's no, right. No. No. <laughs> don't comment. Look, I had to go back. So I went to this party the other night. There was the launch of the new Lamborghini SUV, the ah. Urus, which if you're going, uh, it's kind of close to like Uranus <laughs> and also close to Anus. It's also sort of what the car looks like. It's not a good looking vehicle. But if you'll notice on this picture of my Instagram, this was in the Batcave. That was the from the oh, Dark wow. Knight Batcave when they the mansion burns down and they go underground. That's cool. So it actually was in the Batcave, and uh, there was a green tint to that. This is a better image of that. So that was very cool, and uh, Fabio was there. That was also cool, and uh, it was co-sponsored by Roger Dubuis, and so I got to have some hands-on with these watches. Holy hell. These things are crazy. Yeah. Um, I don't know the exact model number of this one I'm showing, but it's crazy skeletonized uh, Torbion, and it was $300,000. <laughs> and what can you tell me about Roger Dubuis? Just an unbelievable amount of decoration. It's absolutely insane how much decoration they do. They have... Um, so when I was in uh, Geneva working for... Swit- or not working for Switzerland, but working for Vacheron Constantine. Yeah. Uh, in the Vacheron building, they're actually doing the Roger Dubuis watches. Oh, they, they, they share a space? Yeah. Oh, okay. Um, and the components are made in the same facility. Is it a very small company? Yes, it's tiny. Yeah. Yeah, very, very small. They don't make a lot of watches. They're they very said this was like, a, I think, 100 pieces or something. I, that may I be would confident. Be, yeah, a hundred pieces would be like maybe in the next ten years they'll make a yeah. hundred of those ones and sell yeah. them. Yeah. Well, if you think so, that that actually was sort of normal. Look at this. This was called wait the Quator. 
Yeah, so four this tourbillons. Ha- it's not four <laughs> tourbillons. I said that too. What? That is four gyro ba- tourbillons. Gyro oscillating balance wheels. Which I don't know. I meant to ask you why are those not tourbillons, but they said I said tourbillons. They said no, oscillating balance wheel. I don't know what the difference is. Can you? You're you look yeah, stumped okay. too. What's the difference? So I don't know much about this watch, but I'm guessing what they did is that they actually have four balance wheels in there. Yeah. And it's built like a regular movement. Yeah. But it's free to just kind of go with gravity. Uh huh. So um, kind of like gimbal mounted, you know. Okay. Is what I what I would think uh, based on that name that they gave it is that those are always staying in a position where gravity is acting on the spring in the same way. So they, when you move the watch, yeah. the the balance wheel stays in the same position, right? No, they no. Power oscillate back and forth slowly, like a tourbillon. So they're would not move. turning then. No, it's, it sounds like what, they basically took a tourbillon and then uh, <laughs> changed one little wheel in it yeah. so that it. It's like, well, we don't we don't go at you know, uh, we don't go at three degrees. Yeah, we're, yeah. we're a six degree. Uh, so then okay. we renamed it. Well, I, what the way that they described this to me, which I found so interesting, and if you if you're not watching the video portion of this podcast, I'm sorry, but what you're looking at is a watch with two hands, hours and minutes, okay? <laughs> <laughs> then has four escapements and four balance wheels, and one mainspring. It is a manual wind watch, okay? So basically, it's the the analogy would be if you had a car, okay? This car was a normal looking car on the outside, it had four wheels. Had one engine and four transmissions, but all of those transmissions went to the same wheel, and it was ultimately one wheel drive. That's how I was described as one engine, four gearboxes, one wheel drive. Yeah, I mean, you can see. <laughs> That's hilarious. Right? You see those? Uh, you got the wheel up here for. Uh, oh, for, we're pointing at yeah, the, the and top. Got, it's yeah. all just connect. It's connected. Yeah, it's so. Got four full drivetrains in there. It's so crazy. <laughs> But anyways, that yeah. is this watch. How much? Oh, well, this one, this was the starting level model, which was, this is a complete silicone case, <laughs> and that was 500000 And you could get it with a gold for like like 700000 like more gold. Wow. It's like, it was all gold. <laughs> so nuts. Yeah. So of the Reachmont groups, oops, let's go back to my Reachmont groups here. That's, that's down here, but we also have Vacheron. Which you have, uh, you have the Vacheron there. Yeah. Um, but all of these brands, unlike Swatch Group, you've got high, you know, medium end, and then lower end brands. These are all high. There's not a cheap watch in this group. Maybe Bal Mercier, and even those cheapest ones are like fifteen hundred to two grand. Yeah. Nothing cheap in this group. Yeah, they're they're definitely more into uh, higher end jewelry. And mechanical watches. Mm-hmm. It, they've purchased companies that are of a pretty high level in the watch world. Of the um, of the brands on this list, uh, which include, I, I'm here. I'm going to try. Alanga Unsune. Is that about right? Yeah, that sounds fine. Lang, just Lang. Yeah, I just say I say Lang, and that's but, okay. But some people, you know, are very intense about it. And, and actually, at Vacheron, I was taught. By, my trainer was from uh, Lang and Son. Yeah, yeah. He, I, I think that we should set an example of not being the people who are going to be snobby about names on this show. Everything's yeah. French <laughs> or Swiss, or it's got some weird name. And you know what? I'm not going to exclude people who are enthusiastic about watches because yeah. they can't the, pronounce the, a name like I can. Getting snobby about the names is a pet peeve of mine because I have a lot of people that talk to me about watches. And they're always embarrassed to say the brand name. Yeah, yeah. Because it's French, mm-hmm. whatever. And they don't want to sound stupid. Yeah. So then they, they tell me and they describe the watch and they know the brand name, but they don't <laughs> say it. They're like, this watch, it starts with an, an O yeah, and yeah. it ends with an uh. <laughs> and it, they made the, the Seamaster thing. And, yeah. and then I'm like, Omega, Omega. They're yeah. just scared to say it. I understand. It's intimidating. Yeah. And like, the way that people are so rabid about Porsche and all that and that kind of stuff, yeah. and actually, I think it's worse than with cars because the people like I don't know about you, but probably not you because you went to a school. But like I, when, when, as I'm learning about watches, 99 percent of the time, I'll have read that name a million yeah. times and recognize it and know what it means. But like I've never spoken those words out loud to anybody. Yeah. So like I don't, I'm really throwing it out there, and then we get judged. 
Yeah. <laughs> All right. So in this Richemont group of watch brands, what are the yeah? What's the story with the componentry? What is the shared? What what gets bounced around and can be found in these different brands? So the Richemont group is has a big partnership with uh, Eta. Okay. Or as they say in Switzerland, they say Ita. Ita. Yeah. And so a lot of Eta movements in the Eta l- movements less in the, in the lower end. Um, and then they also have some some other partnerships, like I mentioned the the Vacheron with Frederick Piguet. Um, Wait, I'm sorry. Go through the list. I got hung up on the pronunciation of Lang. You, by all means, go through the list of brands for those not looking at our. Yeah, list. yeah. So we got uh, Lang and Soon, uh, Lang and Soon, whatever, whatever. Uh, Bauman Mercier, Cartier, IWC, uh, Gégé Lecoultre, uh, Mont Blanc, Officine Panerai, uh, Piaget, Roger Dubuis, Vacheron Constantin, Van Cleef and Arpel. All high end. Yeah. All low. Bon Mercier, probably the lowest there, right? Yeah, I'm trying to think. Uh, They have, um, well, I mean, Mont Blanc has been picking it up lately. Yeah, I just. But they were lower end. They, I mean, they weren't even a watch company. Mont Blanc's in the airports. Yeah, the pens. Dude, I just went to the. I was uh, flying back from Galapagos. The Panama City Airport has two Mont Blanc stores. Wow, <laughs> and uh, they've got these Time Walker is the new yeah, yeah. the new series Time Walker watches. Let me see if I can get a uh, an image of it. Um, not bad looking, like uh, kind of like Cartier esque. Uh, I think in the image in here we go. Time Walkers. These are good looking watches. Here, wait. They're kind of expensive though. Well, <laughs> you're saying Cartier like Cartier makes a lot of the movements. Oh, really? For for their Mont brands. Blanc, yeah. Oh well, this would this would then not make not sense. necessarily for Mont Blanc, but for their brands, for the other and brands, for other brands as well. Ah, yeah. It's so weird with Cartier. I mean, obviously, you know, they're a famous watch company yep. among other jewelry, but you don't you don't think of them as being the technical innovator. Yeah, you really, would, you would expect that they would use uh, Some, an Eta movement, someone or else's somebody movement. else's yeah. movement, especially because Cartier seems totally okay making like some fairly janky quartz stuff. Not janky is the wrong word, but like more uh, more of a jewelry, fashiony item. jewelry yeah, stuff. Fashion, that jewelry, is, yeah, yep. yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but yeah, okay. So Mont Blanc, Balmercier is sort of the entry level, and then we go up, up from there. Yeah. Um, um, and I mean, these some of these brands are just off the charts, crazy prices, crazy uh, decorations and complications. Um, all the way up through to grand complications with uh, with, with Vacheron. Vacheron. When you were yeah. and, we and have, I'll pull this. I'll pull this. This up. That's this is called the overseas. Is that the yeah, overseas? Program? The overseas. This is their one and only sport watch. I uh, I uh, actually really like this. It reminds me so much of the AP Royal Oak. Yeah. In the same guy designed both. Is that what I read? Um, I feel like I not, read that. It, it was no? not the the same person. It rumored, um, that rumored designed the, this one. Where was it? I could have sworn I had that written down. <laughs> Damn it. Uh, maybe not. Nope. I did write peak 70s in quotes, <laughs> though. It really is peak 70s. That integrated bracelet thing. Yeah, the integrated bracelet. And this watch is... They're they're complex. They have a lot of decoration and polishing and different surface finishes in the case. The assembly and disassembly of this is pretty intense. It's really? It's a time-consuming watch to work on. What makes them... I mean... Look, it's a very nice watch. It's pretty. It looks well made. I mean, it, it looks, you know, at least at least as nice as anything else. Yeah. You know, but to me, it doesn't it doesn't immediately jump out at me like, oh my god. You know what I mean? Right. Uh, let's see. Crown and Caliber's got this one for ninety one hundred dollars used in what looks to be very nice shape. Yeah. Um. But so what? You know, com- what is this compared to like a Royal Oak or compared to? a normal high-end watch. What is it about that Vacheron that's really going to be next level? So this Vacheron, I mean, the the bracelet is amazing. The movement is a great movement. However, it's not technically an in-house movement or anything. It's it's a, a Frederick Piguet. Uh, the difference with this one that's unique, you're going to get that big date. So like big, the big date. date. Uh, right up at noon. And then uh, you've got your chronograph sub-di- uh, sub-dials there. On this bezel, it's a separate piece that comes out. Then right here underneath the crown is a separate piece that comes off, and all of these are polished separately. You've got your case back here with all the screws, which then holds onto the front elements. And then imagine polishing. I like this the side bracelet. polish. 
That's a cool bracelet, man. Right? Like you have high polish in here on the Maltese cross in the uh -huh. corner, and then you've got a straight grain on the rest of it. Then you got a high polish back here, and you've got a straight grain on the underside. It's very cool. It's all these different high polish straight grain, like satin straight grain up through that Maltese cross bezel, but high polish on the outside. All of that takes a lot of time. When and you're the service the guy on this watch, are you also the polisher? Um, for or, me, I was yeah. because I was in a one-man workshop. If you're back at the service center, um, there's a special person polishing. Very special Vacheron. person. Yes, a very special person. I, if you're I the actually polisher, learned, if you're I the learned pol from the guy that polishes the, the Vacherons Is it one in guy? Switzerland. Um, there's multiple people in Switzerland. And then there is, I believe, one guy. Did you hear yeah, that? Yep. We we'll finally got some quiet, oh huh? Oh, my God. I'm so sorry to everybody about that. <laughs> the, there's literally construction happening outside the window, and it just went away. Yeah. Continue. Uh, I can it's think. That. Isn't it that glorious? <laughs> Let me turn the volume down a little bit. <laughs> All right. Yeah. <laughs> Go ahead. But then there's uh, there's one guy at the uh, service center in Texas that's polishing the, the Vacherons as well. And it's like, that's art in itself, just polishing these watch cases because they're so unique how long does it get take to get like trained to be the vacheron polisher that's many years of polishing <laughs> and not just going to vacheron and learning that's like you have start, to like starting you gotta polish stuff. for yeah. shinola for <laughs> for <Yeah>. a while. <laughs> polish for them then you and can then... step it up eventually you'll get into their group and you can polish some like cartiers that are just all high polish and yeah then... do you think like do, do employees get bounced around between the in the group between brands in the group frequently um they can in the u.s they definitely do mm -hmm. because all of the brands are under one roof in the wait okay who is in the u.s uh so in the u.s meaning the the richemont north america oh, group oh oh yeah um, whereas if you go over to Europe, you're going to see that Vacheron stands alone. They have in their own. Yeah, they've got they have their, their own, own workshop. factories and workshop. Yeah. Um, however, you could be a Vacheron worker there and assemble some Roger Dubuis pieces. You could be a Vacheron worker there, and you could be transferred into the Roger Dubuis school, or you could come from the school and go to JLC up into the valley and work on decoration and, and manufacturing there if it's something that does not have the Geneva seal. So, yes, it is. It is possible. Yeah. And then also, Richemont, uh, they have JLC, and uh, JLC, the maker of movements yeah. as well. And, uh, and uh, which we brings me one. to, I finally have a reason besides ego to bring this stupid thing out. This is my, check this out, this is my Ralph Lauren uh, uh, Sport Chrono. And it's made by JLC with a JLC movement, mm. and it's in like check this. I if I if I pull up down here, just that noise is back now. Oh, <laughs> fucking thing. Here's the uh, Richemont groups, uh, the the years of the companies uh, that under uh, were founded, and then there's a joint venture section at the bottom that says in 2007 they joint ventured with Ralph Lauren to create a few watches, and they uh, this this sport chrono. That I have, and then the world timer that I love so much were uh, the first two. What do you got? What are you looking at back there, Cameron? Right. What do you got? This is not a JLC. This is a. It's not. Uh, this is a Cartier. Oh really? Yeah. Oh shit! I did not know this. Yeah. Do you want to take the back off that? You can if you want. It'll never get wet. Um. Is it no, worth? Is it are, worth it? These are pretty fine screws that are on the back there. So what? What? Um. What would you use to identify this movement as a Cartier movement? So. He's the big the thing is going to be this bearing right here in the center of your oscillating weight. Okay. And then this big bridge here. Just underneath the oscillating weight. Yep. Uh-huh. Which takes up like three quarters of the yeah. of the movement. Yeah, it covers pretty much everything up. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and down here you can see the uh Let's um see. the can crown I, wheel for the chronograph. That's about that is as much as I can zoom in there. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so that uh, indicates our, our features of Cartier movement. Yeah, so that's interesting. I, right. I was always uh, I thought they used the JLC uh, movements exclusively, but so did not. I. I just yeah. I I have been telling people the wrong shit. I'm yeah. wrong. No, well, oh, this is still an amazing movement. That's nice. Yeah. Oh, so is that is that a like a module stuck onto a normal Cartier movement, or is that a fully this is fully integrated? Yeah. yeah. So yeah. how about that? It turns out, flip it over. Exactly. So it's actually better than having that JLC uh, oh, um, 889 
Well, it's it's a nice watch, actually. I don't do white dials so much, but it's a nice watch. I, just, I wish I got more use out of it. Yeah. So there you go. That's Ralph Lauren fashion watch with a real Cartier movement. Yeah. And because it doesn't say Cartier on it, it's fucking worthless. <laughs> <laughs> if, it said, if that said Cartier on it, right, then it's a $15,000 watch, right? Because yeah. it says Ralph Lauren, or, you know, at least maybe yeah. five or I, six. I think you'd probably you know. find more... Uh, more people on the resellers market that are into it 100 percent. or forget resellers the brand new market yeah the reason that i like to be like oh it's super rare yeah because like <laughs> nobody, nobody bought it, it. <laughs> yeah <laughs> um what else is in this in the richemont anything else worth richemont well here's a cartier oh tiny little cartier a cartier tank tiny cartier it's right? cute it's that's a small put put a uh, i would say what? well i would say it's uh this one's a women's watch it probably is, but I mean, hang on. Let's do this. Let's. Why did we send? What did the, is that? Why did we get that one from Crown and Caliber? Because I wanted something Cartier for the the group. Oh, you just said anything Cartier? Um, no, I said I picked this one. Oh, okay. Yeah, I mean, this is quintessential Cartier right there. It is, and if if you're but a look man at the size, out there, it could fit inside <laughs> of that uh, Seamaster. It will, but it's definitely a women's watch. Yeah, and it's also uh, only two thousand bucks. That's yeah. twenty one hundred bucks. So if you're if you wanted to give something to your lady, that's a nice one. Exactly. Is that a, is that a real movement in that Cartier, or is that a quartz uh, movement? Probably. This one is one of their intro tanks, and I believe it might even be quartz. So it's a good women's watch. I mean, for somebody who, if you're, if you don't want to deal with winding a watch, yeah, yeah, it's pretty. A quartz that looks nice and has it's some classic. history, recognizable immediately. This is a good watch. What is uh, what is Van Cleef and Arpel Arpels about? Is that a, is oh man, they are. A very interesting company. They use really nice movements, uh-huh. and they have amazing dials um, with things like shooting arrows over the moon and through <laughs> stars and stuff oh, okay. like this. Okay, hang on, yeah, I'm like pulling up. I'm pulling the up their website right now. Yeah, yeah on, their main on. business is jewelry. So their watches are basically Holy a jewelry. Shit, piece. look at these things. Poetic right? complications. Yeah. So it's like a complication that like tells a story. Yeah. Wow. Poetic astronomy, retrograde movement. Yeah. What is poetic astronomy about? So like you see the one with the the oh, the God. it's like celestial know, movements, right? right? And then you have like the two lovers coming over the bridge in Paris, <laughs> and then they they kiss, and then they bounce They're back. Animated. This right? one's got constellations on it. I bet. These are really affordable and val- <laughs> value priced, right? Yeah, very inexpensive, right? Or, right around a few hundred thousand dollars. It's diamonds and gold. <laughs> it's all about it's diamonds and gold. And wow, look at that! What is there's a case opening? What's happening underneath that case? I can't really see the screen so well, Cameron. What's um, so right here we've actually got that jeweled dial. With, That's just uh, covered in diamonds. Huh? Yeah, and those are different. Uh, what do you constellations on the dial? Made in diamonds. That move around. <laughs> they actually move, so they're jumping the constellations, wow. and you're seeing the nighttime sky of, I guess, whatever time it is. Oh wow, the whole and dial it's a moves. Sapphire, the sapphire dial screws on top wow. of that, and these are actual parts of the movement that are decorated like that. That is so yeah. crazy. How much is that? You hundreds, know, I don't of th- even... hundreds of thousands of dollars, right? Yeah, I don't even know their pricing wow. because I. They're really <laughs> rare. Yeah, you have, have to. Have you ever seen one? I have. They have a boutique on Rodeo. Oh, they I, do. I, oh, we I'd have walk to by go. it and take a look. Yeah, it's, we've got it. Really go. pretty we cool. Have to go look. Yeah, I know somebody who who was a watchmaker for them. Really? Yeah. So is it? So, but they use real. They use really good movements. Oh, yeah. then as well. Okay. Yeah. So under uh, underneath all of that, there's a uh, there is a movement. Huh? Yeah. And they don't really talk too much about it because they're more of a yeah. a jewelry company, but they still so have funny. amazing uh, horology. How about that? Um, all right, let's uh, let's go to the next big group, which is uh, LVMH, Louis Vuitton Moet Hennessy. <laughs> I, it's my favorite of the group because it involves two different types of booze. <laughs> yeah, uh, um, LVMH uh, makes a lot of things besides just watches. Um, obviously, yeah. it, just listen to the name. Yeah, none of those they're things, a luxury group. Yeah. They're not necessarily a watch group. Yeah, none of those things are are uh, in the name are watches, but yeah. uh, they make uh, Bulgari, uh, Hublot, Tag Heuer, Zenith, Chalmay, Fred, and Dior. 
What's Fred? I don't, I don't know. know. I don't know what Fred is. I, that one I do not know. <laughs> this li- this list was as of a couple years ago. They may have ditched Fred. But yeah. <laughs> so maybe Fred some... Fred was one of the uh, the people up in the in the mountains making oh, watches. Oh yes. Yeah. Fred. Fred. The mo- Fred the movement maker. Yeah. He's he's the the force behind all Fred, Richard Jeff Millet. And Dave. <laughs> <laughs> Richard Millet is really Fred Millet. Yeah. <laughs> um so LVMH, um, what are they about, Cameron? Uh, well, now they have Jean-Claude Bivet uh, at the helm, which is yeah. a, a big deal. He's been in the industry a long time. Uh, he he really is very smart when it comes to marketing, and he knows, or he used to really know what people want from watches. That is, um, so, like, that seems like a dumb thing to say, but, like, to know what people want, but, like... That is a, yeah, when, a like difference when he, uh, between a lot of people who are super, super successful yeah. and someone who is totally middle of exactly. the road. Exactly. He, he listened to the clients. And one of the big things, so he took the brand name Blancpain, which had shut down and was no longer operating, and he purchased it. He restarted Blancpain, and he said, no quartz. We will not do cheap watches. We are only going to do complications. So they made very complex watches, very small watches, not like big Panerai style watches. These were small, complicated watches. And at that time, that was very interesting. Hmm. Uh, And what they would do is when they would sell watches in the U.S., he would deliver them and he would talk to the people who were buying them. What do you mean, personally? Yeah, personally. They were he selling that fly, few watches that he could he go would individually. Fly out. When they first started, imagine they were selling very expensive, complicated there watches. There being a business class right? plane ticket baked into the price of every, <laughs> every watch. Yeah. If he showed up from Switzerland to California and he's like, this is part of your purchase, I'd be like, fuck, you could have saved me 10 grand by staying the fuck home. <laughs> well, at that point, he wasn't like, uh, he wasn't the guy he is today. Yeah, he was yeah, not yeah. Big wig at that yeah, point. Yeah, he had to hustle at that yeah. point. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but flying out and meeting the people who just bought a Grand Sonnery and saying, you know, why did you buy this watch? Mm-hmm. What, what else interests you? What And just talk to them and, and see what they're doing and what their lifestyle is and why they bought the watch. Yeah. So he stayed in touch. That was It was very important. And the whole no quartz and only going mechanical and only high end decoration and high complication. So it's about the it's about the brand repositioning. That's yeah. what it's about. So it's yeah. about all right, quartz equals cheap and we are going to go the opposite direction of that. Over yeah. decoration, make sure that they know it, this is a luxury product and yeah, not but still looks very um, traditional from the front. Right, right. So it's that understated, kind of like Patek. When did when were op- open backs popularized? Was that that, that was the nineties? Yeah. Yeah. So same. Yeah. So that same that's time. when it was like a be proud of the movement thing. Exactly. Decorate it. Show it off. Yeah. Oh, do you know what the first watch was to do an open display back? I have no idea. I mean, somebody must have done one like a long, long time ago at some point. But. Yeah. Um. So and also. Uh, so now he's with <clears throat> LVMH and. Where I'm sorry. Where was he at the time? Where did he, when he when um, he changed the game after the quartz crisis, where was he at the time? I believe he was with the Swatch Group. Swatch I group? could be okay. wrong, but I think the story goes that he was with the Swatch Group. This. He found out about this uh, this brand Blancpain. He purchased it, resurrected it, and then sold it to the Swatch Group. Well, if I just quickly pull up his his quick history, it says Blancpain. Uh, he purchased the rights to it in 1981. Uh, they had gone on a business in the 70s. Uh, they had uh, been closely associated with closed watches. They did. He ditched the closed watches. Uh huh. He sold the brand in '92 to Swatch Group for 43 million dollars, having initially been purchased for 22,000 Swiss francs. Yeah. You do it, Jean Claude. Yeah. <laughs> Remained CEO of Blancpain until '03. He then joined the board of directors uh, at Omega. Good for him. Main uh, influence uh, was oh, product placement, notably in James Bond film. Celebrity endorsements from Cindy Crawford, Michael Schumacher, and Pierce Brosnan left Omega having presided over the company's dazzling recovery, tripling their sales in 10 years. And then he created basically Hublot, or created the reason anyone knows what Hublot yeah. is. Yeah. Prior to that, it was just like cheap 
porthole looking quartz watches that were not at all the same yeah. as they are today. And uh, I still hate that. I think they're just heinous looking. But I mean, look, they're now they're expensive and people think they're luxury items. And now uh, he became CEO of Tag Heuer in 2014. Uh, and then the company's 30 year cooperation with the uh, motorsport team McLaren came to an end in 2015 after Beaver had a falling out with Ron Dennis. I didn't know about that. We may have to find the deep dive in the falling yeah. out between Beaver and Ron Dennis. Yeah, that I don't know anything and, about. And uh, and then Tag Heuer uh, has subsequently joined with Red Bull Racing. So and then uh, and Beaver now is CEO of LVMH. Uh, I believe it's interim Ch- interim CEO. Yeah, but he's been doing that for a while now. He sounds like a serious pimp. Yeah. Have you met this man before? Uh, I have never met him. No. You, have you heard good things? He seems like a seems like a serious pimp. Well, I worked at Audemars Piguet, so I didn't necessarily oh, hear great things. That's true. They probably yeah. shat on him a lot over there in <laughs> yeah. French. Um, so as far as LVMH's brands go, what are some of the ties we can see uh, in the product? Well, you've got Tag, Zenith, and Bulgari, yeah. who would be like considered the watchmakers. Right. However, Hublot purchased a company called uh i think it was bnb uh-huh. which was a company that only made crazy complicated watches before we had the crash in 2007 okay so this was when people were spending crazy amounts of money on watches and just wanted like oh called? this is a one of one bnb yeah bnb bnb so, yeah and they were look for these things making Basically, custom watches like these things. Yeah, crazy stuff. Look at this. That one I don't believe is from them. No, maybe it is. This but is that a, would here. This me. is a. This looks like a BNB, right? Yeah. Here, just uh, just weird stuff. And you could be a small watchmaker, um, someone who just came up with a crazy concept, and you could call this company up, and they would they, they would make, make you this watch you. If, if you had enough money. Uh, and so what happened is they took these orders for production and prototyping and things, and they started doing work. And then all of these people that wanted to start these watch companies, they all folded, and BNB had all this debt that they had taken on in equipment and design, and they had to. They were essentially going to shut down, fire everyone, and disappear. And Jean Claude Bivet, when he was uh, heading up Hublot, came in, picked them up, and all of a sudden, they owned this company that had developed all of these crazy complicated watches. And owned the IP, presumably, right? Exactly. They owned all of that IP, and these are things that they had created for other people that didn't go through and buy it in the end. So they had this huge backlog of just creative, that complicated other, other stuff. other people yeah. had funded. Yeah, that so other like, people hey, had funded. Bust out that one and yep. uh, paint it all red. Add some diamonds. Yeah. Boom. Who blow so Big Bang? They came upon this amazing uh, mass of knowledge and manufacturing ability with Hublot, um, which kind of brought them into the watchmaking world as opposed to just being a, a brand name. Uh, um, and Hublot, I'm just going to pull up a few. Here's a uh, typical. I'm going to pull it up. Typical Big Bang. It's you know, it says something. <laughs> yeah, and a, I mean they're it makes a they're statement. definitely on the sport spectrum. Yeah, crazy interesting materials for the cases and construction. And they just came out with a brand new one that's a full red ceramic yeah. case. It's very very intense. Yeah. Um, Crown and Caliber has a lot of them. They are sort of honestly, it's like if you can't afford an AP Royal Oak. That's how I sort of see these. As a, you know what I mean? If you're six grand short of a Royal Oak offshore, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I mean, I'm sorry, I'm not trying to, but 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 look, this is a brand that like basically didn't exist ten yeah. years ago, yeah. And now they're you know they're players, definitely, definitely players. So, uh, but I was trying to push you to talk about the that Bulgari watch and the Zenith, yeah, and so the then, movement uh, of what else do we have here for display purposes? Well, That's, we got this this Hoyer uh, mm-hmm. Carrera watch. Lovely chronograph, but I wanted but the, to sh- yeah the big yeah, one that, is that, that you wouldn't necessarily think of as like high a high level of watchmaking is this uh, Bulgari. I think this is a really cool watch. I'd never even really seen these at all before uh, before this one showed up, but it's actually very kind of nice looking. Yeah, it's a beautiful uh, ceramic case. Yeah, well. Um, they did a really good job with all the polishing and the uh, the brushing on different surfaces, and just 
sharp edges. It's the design really comes through when it's made out of ceramic like this. Yeah, and it sits really nice in the wrist too. It's like a, it's a really like it's got a good yeah. kind of like cuff sort of action. Definitely. And uh, at fifty five hundred bucks, and it's a, and what I think is what I thought was the most interesting thing about it is it's a Zenith El Primero movement. Yeah, which looks. I'm gonna zoom way in here. It looks good. Yeah. Really hit, nicely decorated fo- El Primero. Hit the Primero. focus button there, Cameron. Hit that focus button. Let's see if it re... Oh, uh-oh. There it is. Grab it. Uh-huh. Um, it's very pretty. Oct- right? It's called Octo Velocissimo. Yeah, Octo Velocissimo. Octo Velocissimo. Velocissimo. Ah. Um, <laughs> so I'm guessing that all of these... Uh, does Do the tags also use El Primero movement? The... Tag watches have their own chronograph. I think they have their own movement. Right? Yeah, the but Bulgari, you're going to find this El Primero in there, and you're also going to see it in all the uh, Zenith. Yes, chronograph which we have watches. seen. We have seen a many Zenith before. Yeah, um, that is heavy, heavy hitters. And then the uh, we have a good a good one here, uh, Caring Group, which if uh, is a little smaller. Yeah. Tell me about the Caring Group. Well, the Caring Group, not only do they have watch brands, but they also have surf brands. They they own uh, sunglass companies. They own uh, they have Kelly Slater's brand, the Outer Known brand. Kelly Slater. All I care about him now is that he has that wave that wave park, <laughs> which is right? the coolest thing ever. Yeah, it's genius, genius. But um, as far as watches go, is there a thread that draws Boucheron? Uh, you, can you please say the names? I'm embarrassed. Uh, Boucheron, <laughs> Gerard Perigo, Jean Richard, Gucci, and you listen Arden. All very nice watches. Yeah, um, I mean the you listen Arden is a, a new one. They were independent, owned by uh, an American. An American? Yeah. A, an American person? Uh, yes. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. What happened? Uh, well, he passed away, ah. and then it went under a new CEO, and eventually, it was purchased. I'm a big fan of the crazy Ulysse Nardens. They're they're innovators. Yeah, uh, the, the, they're freak, definitely innovative. The freak watches, they're awesome. Yeah, they're so cool. And uh, what about um, the other ones on the list? I've never heard of Jean Richard before. Jean Richard is a. I hate saying lower end, but it's because it's not really lower end. It's just not crazy expensive. Yeah, they're in the thousand dollar range. Okay, so that, they're in that five hundred to Swiss? thousand Swiss brand. Okay, um, but again, mostly a brand. They're not manufacturing things like components or anything. They're just the brand uh, putting the watches together, designing them. But Swiss brand and probably at a movements in the majority of their uh, their stuff. Uh huh. But a great price point. If you want to get into mechanical watches and and have a cool watch, Swiss made. Do they have part? Do you, do you? I mean, I don't really see where a lot of parts sharing would happen in this particular group. There, do you? Yeah, there won't be. Um, now, Gerard Perigo will not necessarily be sharing parts. However, Gerard Perigo does make movements and sells them to other companies. Okay. So you'll see Gerard Perigo movements in Vacheron watches. Hmm. Uh, You'll also see them, I believe they were in Cartier watches for a little while, and I have seen them elsewhere, too. I think Audemars Piguet and Patek have used them. Oh, I didn't realize it was yeah. so, they were so proficient, pr- prolific yeah. with their movements. Yeah, they, oh, had, right. they had one very reliable uh, automatic movement, which is and very thin automatic movement, which is actually in this watch Oh, here. you have one? Yeah. We have one. Oh, how about that? Well, then let me yeah. zoom in. This, this is beautiful. Right, um, just simple, simple dress watch, very classic. Um, man, I wish I wore suits sometimes <laughs> to wear this kind of stuff. That watch is super thin. Right? Turn it, turn it sideways. It's got to be what is that like four millimeters or something like that? Maybe. Yeah, maybe I'd say four millimeter four? case with a little bit of the dome on the case back and the crystal it might be five, but it's, it's pretty very, thin. very pretty. Yeah. So is that? Um, they make this movement? Yeah, so Gerard yeah, Perigo yeah. makes this movement, and they sell it to a few other watchmakers, but it's a very high-quality movement. It's not something you're going to see um, in any brands under a few thousand dollars okay. second, on the second-hand market. Um, 
because it really is nicely made, highly decorated, and it's exclusive. Something that they only sell to the higher level brand names. Yeah, yeah. Cool. Yeah. Uh, let us round this out with our list of independents. And uh, this list is a couple of years old, actually. I got it off. I couldn't find a more updated list, but so something might. Breitling is not independent anymore, correct? Uh, so Breitling is owned by an investment group, right? So it's not but fully independent. It's not. They're but not it's, with another watch company. Okay, so this yeah. then it's still accurate. Yes. Yeah. Uh, Audemars Piguet is still private. Rolex is like on the edge of a group because. They own sub companies that manufacture. Mm-hmm. Um, They're as like, far as aren't brands they kind go, of like their own group? Yeah, kind of. It's really like the Rolex group that makes yeah. Tudor watches. Right. Uh, but because I don't believe they're selling components to, to other companies or anything like that. Um, the, let's see, Chanel and Hermes. Hermes is going to be uh, Richemont, I believe. Okay, so someone jumped the shark. Sorry, people, my list is off. And then Richard Millet, Richard Mille. Yep. Um, Which is, is uh, partly owned by um, Audemars Piguet. Oh, is it? Yeah. Oh, I didn't know that. They don't really publicize that so much, do they? No, not not too much. But Audemars Piguet, uh, uh, Renault and Papi, oh. APRP, uh, is their high-level, complicated workshop that is similar to a place kind of like that BNB company yeah, I was talking yeah. about earlier, um, except it's it's brand owned by Audemars Piguet, mm. and that's where the concept Audemars Piguet watches are made, mm-hmm. and also watches for somebody like Richard Meal, unless it happens to be one of the Vaucher Fleurier uh, movements, which those are made in a different group, the Parmigiani uh, group. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Which are also very nice. Yeah. So um, there's other groups besides these ones, but it, like the we just hit the the top ones that are really massive and sell like 99 percent of the watches. And then Seiko also goes yeah, on Seiko. that list, which yep. is a huge group and is uh, is has many sub brands and is not on this list either. But uh, uh, it, even if you look at the independent brands, if I just look based on what you've said, like. So many companies have sold stuff to other companies. You mentioned yeah. AP is using this movement, and you know, yeah. Uh, you the, look in the the, the, the RPG watches, yeah. you're gonna find movements that are JLC movements. Yeah. In some of them, you're gonna find Frederick Piguet movements. So that means you're you're gonna buy your independent Audemars Piguet watch that contains a movement from the Swatch Group, yeah. or contains a movement from uh, the Richemont Group, or they're now they have in-house movements as well, um, but it's not all in-house. Yeah, and there's almost I, I don't I don't know if there's any companies that are completely in-house with everything. And you can buy a Rolex with a Zenith movement. Yeah, uh, yeah. And you can buy. Uh, pa- Does Paddock use anyone else's movements? Uh, they've been really moving away from it, but they have in the past. You used could buy other one. movements. Yeah. yeah, you could get them with Lamania <clears throat> movements, oh, yeah, Lamania. and Lamania is another brand where you're going to see. Vacheron, Audemars, and Patek used the Lamania CH27 base caliber and modified it in their own ways. Um, you will still find it in current modern Audemars Piguet's and current modern Vacheron Constantine watches. And it's a great chronograph movement. Lamania is owned by the Swatch Group. <laughs> and, you know, so you're, you're getting and this round awesome... And yeah, round it's just, we go. Yeah, it's, it's all a matter of saving the knowledge and the tooling... Uh, and the history. Historically, these are amazing products. No matter who makes them, yeah, they're amazing. And the fact that they're still being made and there are still people who know how to make them and know how to decorate them and service them, we can thank Nicholas G. Hayek for that. And speaking of the storing of the tooling and the products, that's going to be a that's going to be a uh, a story for our next episode, uh, which uh, we should sign off and wait for that because we yeah. got a whole bunch of watches we got to talk about on the chronographs episode coming up next i think we covered the family tree right yeah you think so i definitely think so there's other stuff in there if if uh if people want to dig into some smaller groups or some of the groups that are in asia as well and then you've got like frank mueller watch land oh, f- which I, frank mueller watch land yeah that a thing? watch land that's a thing yeah google watch it land get into i'm googling right yeah. now yeah 
We could probably do a whole episode just on Frank Mueller's Watch Land. Wait, Frank Mueller Watch Land. Yeah. And what is... Fr- wait, 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 wait. This is what the yeah. website is. What is Watch Land? So Watch Land is like Frank Mueller's play place in really? Switzerland. Really? It's and unbelievable. Can you go? Um, I believe you can. You'd, you'd have to set up an appointment and go tour the facilities, but uh, oh my God. their big thing is yeah. they make the Frank Mueller watches, uh-huh. but they also make a lot of components for other companies. Huh. So if I'm another brand and I'm like, I need, uh, I need chronograph pushers for this case, you can call up Frank Mueller at Watchland and they can make them for you. Wow. Yeah. And they have this unbelievable facility with tons of buildings and tons of knowledge all on this one campus. Yeah, we should do a Watchland show. And it's kind of like unheard of. People don't really talk about it too much, but they're gigantic. That's extremely awesome. Yeah, Yeah. we should do a whole show on Watchland. That (laughs) sounds great. (laughs) Um, uh, What else do we have to promote? Uh, Well, uh, we're going to have the... uh, the Smoking Tire, Weiss Watch Company, Beeline Coffee, uh, Cars and Coffee. That's going to be this weekend at Weiss. I'm excited about yeah. that. And uh, it's it's like sold out, basically, right? We're out of room. Yeah, we're at capacity. Okay. Not well, that this episode will be out by... Uh, it will. This it episode will? will be up tomorrow. Oh, yeah. Whoa. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. We're no yeah, longer if, ahead if of the curve, If you haven't curve, RSVP'd... Buddy. You should have luck. Wait yeah. till we see the pic. We'll show you the pictures next week. And uh, let's see. Follow moi... On Instagram, The Smoking Tire. Follow Cameron on Instagram, Cameron M. Weiss. Uh, if you want to buy a watch, I've been noticing on Twitter that a couple of our listeners have bought your watches, it seems, over the last month. Yeah. Uh, which is excellent. Uh, he can be reached at weisswatchcompany.com. His lovely wife, Whitney, will get you set, you, set you up with an order. And uh, listen to my podcast, The Smoking Tire. And is that it? Next week, we got chronographs. Thank you to Crown and Caliber. Thank you to Beeline Coffee. I guess let's get out of here. Yeah. Goodbye. Oh, (laughs) you thought we were gone. We're not gone. We were going to get out of here, but we forgot. It's March. It's Watch Madness at Crown and Caliber. So here's how it's going, right? Crown and Caliber is doing a thing with us and with you, and it's called Watch Madness. And just like your March Madness that I know almost nothing about. Do you like sports? I enjoy sports, but I do not watch them, and I do not know anything about who's playing at all. All right, well, we know something about watches, and so we don't, need, we don't need March Madness. We got Watch Madness. So you guys and us will fill out a uh, bracket at, uh, at Crown and & Caliber, and then there will be voting involved to find a winner what is the best watch according to you guys. And then there's prizes. Uh, there's going to be gift certificates. There's going to be luxury watches given away. And so real quick, we're just going to go over our... Watch Madness bracket. I'm going to go first, and then you, because, yeah. Here we go. Here's mine. Uh, the watches on the table are uh, are many and very nice. Uh, I've got, what do I have here? I've got the Weiss watch uh, beating, uh, what is that? Cartier. I'm, I'm looking Pache upside Cartier. I'm sorry. I'm looking upside down. Weiss wins, uh, and then uh, Tag beats the Maurice Lacroix, and then uh, Rolex Oyster Quartz. Beats uh, the uh, Cartier Ronde Solo. Uh, and then I have, what else? The Tag Hoyer Formula beats the Omega Seamaster. Do I have that right? Yep. Yeah. Yep, you got the Tag. Yeah, I'm not that big a fan of that particular Seamaster. That one's got the wavy bezel. <laughs> I'm not about it. Let's see. Uh, the IWC beats the Nomos Tango Mat. The uh, Breitling beats the Tag Monaco. You all know my thoughts on that. Omega <laughs> Speedmaster... Racing beats the Cartier Roadster, and then the uh, Tudor Submariner beats the uh, IWC Chronograph. On the other side, is this how you go through these things? I don't know how to do this. Yeah. Right? Yeah. On the other side, I think I have, what, Bell and Ross uh, beating the Zenith. I then have the Breitling beating the Louis Vuitton. I then have the Tudor beating the Longines, the Glass uh beating that Breitling, the uh, Omega Constellation beating the Breitling Aerospace. The the uh, what is that? The Rolex Oyster Quartz beating the Bomb and Mercier. There, do you notice there's an Oyster Quartz on both sides? This? Yeah, yeah. Why <laughs> there are two Oyster um, Quartzes in this? One of them is going to be a, a two tone <laughs> with the Jubilee style bracelet and that champagne. And the other one is the, the other one one's we, the all silver and white, right? That we, we had, had that on the one. show. Yep. Yeah. And then I have the uh, the Speedmaster Broad Mar- Broad Arrow uh, beating the uh, Graham Silverstone Stowe. I then have the Tudor Prince Date beating the Bell and Ross Aviation. 
And then, do I go through every fucking round? Yeah, yeah I guess you so. have to. All right, I then, uh, uh, then <laughs> well, I'm sorry, Cameron. I have on mine uh, the tag knocking you out. And then, and it's not because I prefer the tag Hoyer Carrera to your Weiss American Issue Field Watch. I own your watch and not a tag. I vote with my <laughs> dollars. But I think other people are not as familiar with your work as I am and therefore may not appreciate it. So I have the tag going to the next round. I then have the Rolex Oyster Quartz, the Breitling, and the Omega re- re- uh, winning that round on that side. And then on the other side, I have, what, the Bell & Ross uh, beating the Breitling, the... I can't read it. Glass shoot. Down. The, thank you, the Glass shoot. Uh, beating the Tudor, the Omega beating the Oyster Quartz on that side, and then the Tudor beating the Graham. I've, not, I've never heard of a Graham. What's a Graham? You heard of a Graham? Um, they're like a pilot style watch. I mean, I like the, the big pushers are kind of neat. Yeah, but their I've whole just... uh, their whole deal was making pushers that you could operate and crowns you could operate. Like while with wearing gloves thick on. gloves, gloves so they have yeah. big pushers, and then some of their watches even had a big lever. For the crown to pop the crown out to the That's next position, it was kind of cool. Pretty intense. Yeah, I like that. Oh, it's yeah. like it's like for a long time, Range Rovers you could had to be able to adjust the climate control and stuff with gloves on. Yeah. Then they went to touchscreens. They completely abandoned it. Yeah. Uh, let's see. In the semifinals, I have the Tag and the Omega, and the Tag beats that Omega, and then on the other side, what do we have here? The the Glass shoot. glass shoot and Bell and Ross. The glass shoot wins. The Omega Tutor. The Omega wins. I wrote Omega there, didn't I? Yep. Yeah. <laughs> and then, yeah, the and then the final is going to be the Tag Hoyer uh, Carrera versus the Omega Speedmaster Broad Arrow. And I have the Speedmaster Broad Arrow to win. Which. You know, honestly, there's not a lot of watches on this list that I am personally very passionate about, aside from your watch. Uh, and the rest of them, it was sort of just like ones I'm casually familiar with. I do like a good Speedmaster Broad Arrow, though. But, uh, yeah, that's mine. Let's go to yours. Yours yours was nice enough to do an electronic PDF form. <laughs> <laughs> mine, not so much. All right, explain to me your bracket, brother. Well, uh, we've got, starting from... The top left-hand corner, which I think is the most interesting uh, thing here. We've got the Weiss watch beating out the Cartier, uh, Pasha de Cartier. And then we've got the Tag Heuer Carrera, of course. Um, It's a great watch beating out the Maurice uh, Lacroix Masterpiece. Uh, We've got the Rolex Oyster Quartz beating out the Cartier. And then the Omega Seamaster beating out the Tag Formula. Um, the Nomos, I took that above the IWC Portofino. And we've got the Breitling Blackbird above the Tag Heuer, uh, Monaco. Uh, then I've got the Omega Speedmaster Racing beating out the Cartier Roadster. And the IWC Chronograph beating out the Tudor Submariner. Um, then I'll head over to the other side, and I've got the, uh, the Zenith Grand Class beating out the Bell & Ross. The Breitling Chronomat beating out that Louis Vuitton. Uh, Tudor Heritage Black Bay beating out the Longines. And that Glass Chute uh, beating out the Breitling Avenger. I've also got the Breitling Aerospace beating out the Constellation Omega. And the Rolex Oyster Quartz going to the next round as well on this side. Uh, and that Omega Speedmaster Broad Arrow uh, beating out that Graham. Bell & Ross Aviation beating out the the Tudor. Uh Let's see, back to the left-hand side. I've got the, the Weiss beating out the Rolex Oyster Quartz and the Breitling Blackbird beating out the... Uh, or the Breitling Blackbird losing to the IWC uh, chronograph. Uh-huh. Uh, so we've got Weiss and IWC on that left side, and I think Weiss has taken that one. Oh! So Weiss to the finals there. Oh, you did a better job of describing that than me. <laughs> I, was try- I was going the wrong way, and I was looking upside down. You had the right order of describing that. Uh, Sorry, audience. <laughs> then if we head back to the right, I've got the that Zenith uh, getting Grand through there. Class. And I've got the, the glass chute uh, going to the next level. Uh, the Breitling Aerospace going to the next level, taking out that Oyster Quartz. Uh, and I've also got that Omega Speedmaster Broad Arrow going to the next uh, next position. I'm glad we're consistent on our like right? of there, broad a lot. Our, our like of Broad Arrow. That Broad Arrow is a nice watch. It's a really nice watch. Um, I did have it losing out to the the Glass Shoot uh, 
original sport evolution just because I, I have a soft spot for the, the glass shoot. Um, but I really do like the Omega Speedmaster Broad Arrow hands. And, and then that chronograph is really nice. Big surprise, the Weiss watch to win. Yep. I would love for your watch to win. I'd be extremely, extremely stoked if your watch won. I don't think enough people know about it. Yeah, yet, I don't. I don't think we're we're well known enough. But we'll get there. it's got to start we'll somewhere. There. So that's our watch madness bracket. Uh, go uh, to crownandcaliber.com. Fill out your own watch madness bracket. It took me about eight seconds to do it, and then vote. And uh, if you win, boy, can you win big. And now, uh, boy, we have a show for you. So let's do it. 